Hello Year 5, welcome to the final reading of Cosmic. It is now the end of our book. We are going to finish it today. So I hope you've really enjoyed this book with us last term and finishing it off this term as well. Now we last left off with Liam in the space shuttle by himself. Everyone else has gone down to the moon and he has had a phone call with his dad and that was a really good point for his dad to get in touch with him. He didn't tell him where he was, he just said he was really far away, didn't he? So let's find out what happens next. Let's see if Liam manages to get home. Okay. This is not a simulation. Well, I did it. I successfully redocked the command module with the dandelion. If it had been a game of Orbiter 4, I would have got an extra life for that. The children came back through the hatch, giggling and pushing each other, and Samson too said, Guess what? You were wrong. What? This is not a simulation. We really are in space. We've just had a water fight on the moon. He went on to explain that water fighting on the moon turns out to be quite complicated. You can squirt the water, all right, but it flies in this spooky curved flight like a diagram following an arc towards the ground. And it doesn't ever find its target. In mid-flight, it turns to tiny clouds and drifts along like ghosts for a while before disappearing altogether. He said it was because we we're in. That is, he said it was because they were in direct, unmediated sunlight. The temperature could have been anything up to one hundred and thirty. The water just boiled. I thought it must have felt quite weird standing there feeling quite comfortable, but knowing that if you took your suit off, you'd boil to death. But they didn't. They smelled slightly fireworky. This was because some of the elements of the moon dust they had trailed in had reacted with the oxygen inside the dandelion, and they were covered in the dust. Just covered. They looked like chimney sweeps. I found a little hoover for cleaning up crumbs attached to the wall near the food covers, and I made them hoover their suits. Otherwise, everyone will know what you did, I said. They'll be able to tell just by looking at you. Max wanted to know why it was such a big secret. Surely it's something to be proud of being the first child on the moon, he said. And Florida said, they're going to find out anyway, next time anyone goes there. Do you know what we did? No, don't tell him, said Samson too. It's a surprise. Oh, said Max, we almost forgot. A present, moon rock, and you gave me a small grey stone from another world. What else did they do down there? Well, seeing as I'm the dad, I'll tell you like a dad would. Number one, how we got there. We had a great run out, we didn't see any traffic to speak of, just one meteor shower and that was it. Number two, what was the parking like? For a start, the parking was completely free of charge and there were an infinite number of parking spaces, as long as you looked out for the boulders and canyons. How, can they how come they can provide ample parking on the moon and not in Bootle, I'd like to know. Three, what was it like in the old days? Well, they had the Apollo programme. There seemed to be some bloke going to the moon every few weeks. I thought we'd all be going there for our holidays when we grew up. Now look. Number four. Something thoughtful which made you think. We walked on the moon. We made footprints somewhere no one else had ever made footprints. And unless someone comes and rubs out those footprints, we'll be there forever. Because there's no wind. Number five. Something to do with last night's football. No football, because there isn't enough gravity. But we had a water fight instead. The winner was surface conditions. After they were back on board, we did one more orbit. Three quarters of the way round, we burned the dandelion's boosters and we were heading back to Earth. They all rushed to the back to watch the moon getting smaller and smaller. Florida did ask me then, What about you, that Dad? Did you have a good time? It was all right. It might look like a coincidence that Dad rang me just as the phones came on, but it wasn't. He'd been trying for days and days. He got through the moment they came back on because he'd been trying all the time. That's what Dads do. I had to look out for the children like Dad looked out for me and his dad had for him right back through time. Dadliness was out there among the stars, a force like gravity, and I was part of it. But in the end, Florida's obsession with weight was what saved us. According to my maths, said Samson too, we should begin re-entry procedures now. You are joking, I said. We're miles away. When you do re-entry on the simulator, the Earth feels like this giant wall right next to you. If you looked out the window now, yes, it looked big, but you could still see the curve. You could tell you were way out. What you're saying is that my maths is wrong, which is simply illogical. What I'm saying is that it looks a bit far away. It looks a bit high. To be honest, I don't want to jump from here. 
Florida, t Florida said, Samson too, when you did your maths, did you remember to add the weight of the dandelion? Or did you do your calculations based on just the command module? Samson too stared at her for a while and then said, excuse me please, and started his maths again. So we're still in high orbit now. We're using the sails to glide down as gently as we can into a lower and lower and faster and faster orbit. It's like the world's biggest, gentlest, helter-skelter, with views of Greenland, the Pacific and northern Russia. Can't we just keep going nice and gently like this till we get down, said Hassan. Sadly not. Eventually we started to see the glowing envelope of the atmosphere. You can't just float through that. It's a firewall. We're back in the command module now. We press, press the green button, all of us together this time. I felt the jolt as we uncoupled the dandelion. I could almost hear Kira Knightley's voice kicking in. You realise you had a choice of carrier today, and we'd like to thank you for choosing, as she drifted off into space. We know what buttons to press to make our descent. We're just waiting for the right moment. The monitors are still all out. Samson 2 is running Orbiter 4 on the wrist station. We're all watching it on the wall. I'm pressing the real buttons a few seconds after he presses the game ones. I gave them a team talk. I said, reinflate your vehicle escape suits and stay calm. I know we can do this because we are cosmic. Then I jettisoned the bottom half of the module, the bit with the window and the door and all those things that can't stand the pressure. So now we're flying blind. We've got no window. I can more or less feel the angle in my bones. If we hit it wrong, we bounce off into space. Now the gravity is really hurting. It must be increasing. We must be right. I'm looking at Dad St. Christopher. It's rocking from side to side like there's an earthquake. I can feel myself getting heavier and heavier like the boy in his story. I can barely move. The simulator is counting down and now I can hear it saying, Uh-oh, you're dead. Next chapter's called, We Got a Bit Lost. It was very quiet. Everything was white and cold. I was lying there trying to figure out what was happening. I could feel something hot breath, stinking hot death breath, and a smell of damp and the sound of breathing. I noticed all these things before I noticed where they were coming from. A wolf. A wolf? I sat up and it snarled at me. More hot, stinking breath. The door of the command module was open. There was snow outside and more wolves, shoving each other, trying to get in. We're back on Earth. But we're tinned food. Something went whizzing past my head and hit the wolf between the eyes. It yelped and backed off. Florida lunged past me, lashing out at the wall and pulling the hatch shut. She yelled, I've just been to the moon and back in an ice cream van. I'm not about to get eaten by a dog. The dogs howled and scratched at the hatch. I said, they're not dogs, they're wolves. She passed out. St. Christopher was in pieces on the floor. So that was what she threw at the wolf. I remember thinking Dad would go mad. He said it really looked after him. Mind you, I suppose it really looked after us. I sat with my back to the door, keeping it pushed shut. That's when I noticed my Drax phone wedged into the multifunctional display unit. I dashed open, over, grabbed it and then threw myself against the door again. That's where I am now. No one is looking for us. I know this because Dr Drax said she would deny all knowledge of us. But now I've got the phone, it doesn't matter. I can tell, call Dad, I can tell him to get someone to find us. I called Dad. The phone rang twice, then it beeped. A text. You have no credit. So now I'm just sitting here, just talking to the phone. No one is listening. Even if someone knew we were out here, how would they find us? One little module the size of a smart car, stuck in the frozen waste of Siberia, which is bigger than Europe. The others are waking up. They're all bruised and bloody. They're glad to be alive, but I don't think they realise that being alive is only a temporary situation. Wait. Got to stop. Got to stop talking because... because my phone is ringing. It was Dad. Liam, it's me. I thought you were coming home today. Dad. Hi. We got a bit lost. I know you're not in the Lake District, Liam. I know you're up to something. Just tell me where you are. Not sure. OK. This is what you do. Find a pub. A pub? No, you're, you're too young. Uh, what else comes up on the Drax world? Libraries, schools, anything like that. Find one, call me back and I'll know where you are. I should be able to tell from the phone, but it's obviously gone wrong. It says you're in Waterloo, but you're not, are you? Maybe. I mean, I might be in a Waterloo. There's only one Waterloo, isn't there? 
no there's hundreds dad one in sierra leone one in brussels one in brazil you're not telling me you're in africa no i don't think so i might be in siberia though very funny leave it with me i'll sort something out he hung up i looked at the others and said what happened i thought we died we forgot about the parachutes again said samson too but then max pressed the button and saved us max said no florida pressed the button and saved us florida said no has sam pressed the button and saved us and sam said no samson too pressed the button and saved us maybe you all did my dad did sort everything out it turns out i was wrong about dr drax of course she was looking for us she wanted to keep our trip a secret so she wasn't going to leave a used spaceship lying around dad's sim card was a clone of mine remember so his phone logged my phone's position and when I saved phone numbers, they saved on his card as well as mine. That was how he was able to call Dr. Drax and give her our precise location. That's why she turned up on in her plane a couple of hours later with blankets and drinks and hot food and a lot more films to fill in. She was very nice to us. Then she said, And oh, Mr. Digby, I believe you have a phone. Hand it over, and any cameras, diaries, anything that proves where you've been. The last chapter I think this is special gravity it's called so where am i now well i'm in the new strand shopping center sitting by the water feature while mum and dad are in switched on electricals upgrading his sat nav i borrowed my dad's phone so i can play snake on it while i'm waiting for them and while i'm noodling around looking for the game i notice that his audio diary is nearly full and that's when i realize our phones were twins when i made my space diary it was saved to his card down here in bootle too so i can listen to it all again and i can tell you how it ends the best thing about being on Earth is definitely the just right gravity. The way you don't float off the floor or feel like you've got a cannonball stuck to your head. People are hurrying past and round each other with their bags and their pushchairs and their shopping trolleys. They come up to each other and then they go away and then they come back again. It's like a great big dance and everyone knows their moves. Then suddenly everyone, everyone moves over towards the windows to switch on electricals. As though some big comet with massive inherent gravity has gone by and they're drawn to it. I know what they're doing. They're watching the launch of a rocket called the Infinite Possibility, which is going to send the first ever child astronaut, a 13-year-old girl called Sejan, into space. She's going to circumnavigate the moon, so she's not just going to be the first child in space, she's the first person to leave the Earth's orbit since 1972. Everyone wants to see her. Her face is on the front of all the papers, on t-shirts, lunchboxes, mouse mats, anything you like. One person has just left the crowd and is heading over to me. It's Dad. He's walking towards me like there's some sort of special gravity pulling him towards me. And maybe there is. Maybe everyone's got their own special gravity that lets you go far away, really far away sometimes, but which always brings you back in the end. Sometimes you float like a feather. Sometimes you're too heavy to move. Sometimes one boy can weigh more than the whole universe. The universe goes on forever, but that doesn't make you small. Everyone is massive. Everyone is King Kong. Everyone in the world remembers where they were when they heard about what Sejan saw on the lunar surface. I was standing in our kitchen. I was about to go to school. I'd just taken my end-of-term report out from under the little grey stone that we use as a paperweight. Mum was reaching up to give me a kiss. Do you know, she said, I'm sure you've shrunk. And she pushed me back against the See How I've Grown chart and measured me. And it was true. I was half an inch shorter than the day I'd started at Waterloo High. Why doesn't that surprise me, said Dad. That would be typical Liam, wouldn't it? To start shrinking as he gets older. To spend his childhood six foot tall with a beard and his adulthood five foot nothing with a baby face. The traffic update had just begun on the radio. Dad turned it up so he could hear it properly when suddenly it stopped and the newsreader came on with this amazing report and Mum turned on the telly and I knew I wasn't going to school. No one was going anywhere that day because Sir Jan had found something on the moon. And really, said the announcer, this find of hers changes everything. We've got pictures. Yes, there it is. There's no doubt about it. It's a man-made object. We know that no Apollo mission went to that part of the moon. It seems unlikely that a secret Russian or Chinese mission would leave such a thing like this. This is extraordinary, inexplicable. This changes our view of everything. It was a load of rocks, squarish grey stone like the one on top of our kitchen cabinet, and all the stones were arranged to spell out some words. It couldn't be a coincidence because it was just so clear. Florida rang up to make sure I was watching. Remember the surprise, she said. I'd completely forgotten about it, but I saw it now, spread out across the lunar surface. Two words. Hello, Dad. Excellent. That is the end of our book.